Hello, Coastway Church. It is so good to be with you. A big welcome to those who are joining us online and those of you who are joining us right here in the room. What is Coastway Church all about? What is our mission? Where are we headed? Where are we going? Well, our mission as a church is to be a disciple-making, Jesus-seeking, renewal-bringing movement of the gospel. And one of the surest signs that we are fulfilling this mission is going to be lives being transformed visibly, practically, relationally, spiritually. And seeing the evidence of that transformation is something that we are so excited about. And the first picture that you see that a life is being transformed by the gospel, it's very public, it's very unapologetic, it is baptism. And Today, we get to celebrate our first ever baptism as a young church. We never, ever want to get over this. We never want to stop praying for this. But I've just been thinking about what is it that goes through people's minds when they hear about baptism? Truthfully, there is a lot of confusion in the world about baptism. And when there's confusion in the world, there needs to be clarity in The church, Christ brought clarity. Coastway strives to give clarity. And so as we think about what baptism is really all about, I just wanted to take a few moments and give a little bit of a biblically rooted explanation around baptism. So essentially what baptism is, is it is a visible sign of a spiritual reality. It is the full life identification with Jesus as king, which means he's in charge, with Jesus as rescuer, which means I am wholly dependent on him for hope, help, and salvation. And when we, when we really look at the pattern of baptism throughout the New Testament, we, really, we see that it's actually a fulfillment of what was happening in the Old Testament. So just think about the relationship with God's people in water from the beginning of, and throughout the Bible. First of all, we see Noah. Okay, what happens with Noah? Well, he is He and his family are rescued through the waters. And then you see Moses, and he comes and he leads the people out of oppression, out of slavery. And how does it happen? It happens through the waters. The prophet Isaiah talks about how salvation would come through the waters. And then Jesus comes and he is baptized himself to fulfill and to model all righteousness. And so this is pervasive throughout the Scriptures. At Coastway, we believe based on the pattern of the Scriptures, uh, 27 out of 27 baptisms that we see in the book of Acts and in the life of Jesus are by immersion after conversion. And so this is one of the signs and symbols that celebrates the evidence of God's uh, God's life touching down in a human life. And if you think about what is it like to skip baptism, it's a little bit like skipping a birthday. Okay, you don't just blow past a birthday. You stop, you celebrate, you remember this was the day that you were born. And baptism is the way that you say this, this is commemorating the, my being born again uh, by the Holy Spirit of God to new life in Christ. And so here's the invitation. Today you're going to see baptism. We're going to end our services a little bit differently. It's going to be amazing. We're not going to end from the stage. We're going to end from the patio outside, and we're going to have a big celebration over over Blair's baptism, but here, maybe for some of you, this is, your story is that you, your life has been surrendered to Jesus. You're unashamed that he is your king and your rescuer, but for one reason or another, maybe it was because of the global crisis that unfolded over the past year and a half, or maybe it was just because you've never been discipled in this area, or called up and called out to take the step. I want to change that right now. If you're unashamed of Jesus as your king and rescuer and you've not gone public through the waters of baptism to identify your life with his, if that's your story, this is your step. You can go to coastwaychurch.com slash baptism. You can talk to any of our team members about baptism. We're doing it again next Sunday. And it's going to be a big celebration. And so you'll notice that the shirt that, that Blair's going to be wearing, that Emily, who's been discipling Blair, is going to be wearing, that I'm wearing, it says, Jesus in my place. That is the message of baptism. Jesus took my place in life and death, and I have forever hope and forever help because he is mine and I am his. And so that's where we're going. We can't wait to celebrate. Here's where we've been, and here's what we have to look forward to today. 
whether on your app or in your lap. Open your Bibles to Luke chapter 15, and if you don't have a copy of God's Word on your app or in your lap, then the Scriptures are going to be on the screens because we want you to be able to follow along as well. And what we are doing is we are in our fourth and final week of this series called Come Home. And the key concept in this series that we've been exploring is that home is a person more than it is a place. God is that person that makes us feel most at home. And where He is, we can be most at home. And so in Luke 15, here's what Jesus is doing. He is sharing and He is showing His heart for everyone to see. Have you ever just put yourself out there, had a vulnerable moment, and you kind of let your hair down and you just let people see what's really important to you? That's what Jesus is doing right here. And for us to really unlock the meaning of the stories that he's telling in Luke chapter 15, we have to consider who's actually in the room. You have rebels who are in the room. These are the tax collectors, these are the sinners, these are the unsightly in society. And then you also have religious people in the room. These are the people who grew up in church. These are the people who know their Bibles. These are the people who do their Jesus Calling devotions each and every single day. But what you have to see is that the message of Jesus always matches His mission. And you see, Jesus' heart is for both religious sinners and rebel sinners. You think about the, the religious sinners. There's, there's this guy named Nicodemus. He comes to Jesus in John chapter 3, and he's really he's spiritually curious. There's a good chance Nicodemus was there in the room when these stories were being told. And he would end up being a disciple and a follower of Jesus. There's Joseph of Arimathea, whose to, in whose tomb Jesus was laid. And he was a religious teacher. He was, he was a religious sinner. There's a chance he's, he's present whenever Jesus is telling these stories. There's a man named Saul who would go on to be Paul. He was a religious sinner. And God forever changed and touched his life. But then you got the rebels. Uh, you, you've got the woman caught in adultery in John chapter 8, and you see how Jesus advocates for her dignity. Even though she had gone far off from him, you, you see the prodigal son who we looked at last week. You see this sleazy tax collector named Zacchaeus. And all in the room and all around the table, you have both parties. And they don't like each other a whole lot. They don't get along very well. Jesus is the bridge. So last week what we saw was basically act one of this incredible drama. The, the greatest short story that's ever been told, the story of the prodigal son. So we saw Act 1 of the prodigal son in verses 11 through 24, which highlights the rebellious son who wandered off and wasted his life and blew a fortune that he demanded from the father. And today we're going to look at Act 2, the religious sinner, verses 25 through 32. And I, there's a lot of responses to wrongdoing in our world. There's a lot of different ways. There's even these characters that will be cast in Netflix series and movies that we watch, they, they just personify uh, th this judgmental response to wrongdoing. And the one that comes to my mind is Angela from The Office. And so just for me to pastor you well, I need. do we have any Office fans in the house of the Lord today? That is incredible. Well, Angela, just a brief bio on Angela. She is the resident, rule-keeping, judgmental, goody-two-shoes at Dunder Mifflin Paper Company in Scranton, Pennsylvania, off the show The Office. To thicken the plot, she's a crazy cat lady. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you're a crazy cat lady, but she's a crazy cat lady. And here's what she likes to do. She likes to keep her unsightly sins in the shadows, and she likes to spotlight the unsightly sins of others. And just some common banter and exchanges between Angela and her disgruntled co-workers. I think about you just Pam, the receptionist. So poor Pam. Angela comes to Pam, and she's just like, Okay, Pam, uh, I'm having some relationship problems. And since you're always having relationship problems, I thought you could give me some advice. Or then there's this exchange between her and sweet old Phyllis. She wouldn't hurt a fly, but she's a little oblivious at times. And they're hanging up this big banner outside the conference room, and the banner says, Lunch Party. And old Kevin walks by, and Kevin's like, Isn't 7 p.m. a little late for a lunch party? And then Angela just scruffs and gruffs, and she looks at Phyllis, and she's like, Phyllis, it was supposed to say, Lunch Party! And Phyllis is like, Angela, how do you feel that it says lunch party? She says, I'll tell you how, how I feel. I'm angry. 
I'm angry that you did something so stupid. And I'm angry at myself that I would think that you could do anything but be stupid. And so here we have Angela. And what Angela really personifies is this broader perception throughout majority culture on how Christians really are. We're judgmental. We're stuffy. We're unapproachable. We're grumpy and grouchy. Did you know that 90% of 16 to 29-year-olds believe that Christians are like Angela? And that that is what is the the biggest barrier between uh, emerging generations and the church. And here's the good news that I want to bring to you right now. God looks nothing like the judgmental portrait cast by characters like Angela. He's kind. He's patient. He's gracious. He's approachable. And if you want to get to the heart of how God relates to us in our failures, you look no further than the father's response to his two sons in this story. We saw last week how he responded to the rebellious son's improbable homecoming. How even after wasting the father's fortune in a distant country, he came to himself. And he came home. And he was prepared for the worst. But before he could even verbalize his plea plea bargain, we see that the father actually cuts him off with unrestrained compassion. Fully restoring his place in the family, he throws an outrageous party. And so you look at verse 24 and we see they began to celebrate. And so by this point, okay, remember who's in the room? The religious crew. By this point, they're probably like, Jesus, that's a fascinating story that you just told. But he's not done. He's got something for everybody in the room around the table. And so an attentive listener will will, will recognize that Jesus is continuing the story because in Luke 15, 11, it started by saying there was a man who had two sons. Not one, but two sons. And oddly enough, guess who's mysteriously absent in verse 24? It's this older brother who we're introduced to in verse 11. And here's the leading question that I think is going to guide the message today. It's this, is your attitude toward God based more on works or on grace? You see, uh, C.S. Lewis, he's arguably the the greatest Christian thought leader of the 20th century. He once walked into a British conference where where there was this debate happening on the distinction between major world religions. And so they were going back and forth and they're like, there's really nothing fundamentally different about Christianity and other uh, other religions. Right, C.S.? And C.S. C.S. looks back and he says, oh, no, 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 that's easy. It's grace. (laughs) And then he walks out of the room drops the mic, conversation's over. Uh, Bono, the lead singer of U2, who I only quote every now and then, put it this way, grace defies reason and logic. And what is grace? Well, let's just keep it simple. (laughs) Grace is when God gives us something really good when we deserve something really bad. You've got to understand this about grace to get it. It's relational. Now, what's religion? Religion is us thinking, being hoodwinked by the devil, literally, thinking that when we do good, God should give us good in return. And here's the difference between religion and grace. Religion and the gospel, you've got to understand this. Grace is relational, religion is transactional. And just to give clarity on the difference between works-based religion and a grace-based celebration, a works-based religion is fueled by anxious fear. But a grace-based salvation is fueled by grateful joy. Religion is rooted in the gifts from the giver. The gospel and grace is rooted in the giver himself. Religion is rooted on my resume. So when I'm doing good, I'm feeling good. But when I'm doing bad, I'm going to hide it and inwardly I'm, I'm in torment. But the gospel grace focuses on Jesus' resume. So even when I fail, I still have a future. The religion says my worth is based on my works and what I do, but grace, worth is based on Jesus' works and what He did. Religion says that I have to achieve approval, but grace says I can receive approval. Religion says that my activity defines my identity, but grace in the gospel says that my identity defines my activity. Religion worships self. Grace worships God. And so here's what I want to spotlight as we journey through the story. The harmful nature of works-based religion. 
And we need to recognize that this form of phony faith has equal potential to lead us away from home as the reckless behavior of the prodigal son who we talked about last week. But then what I want to do is I want to, I want to spotlight the grace of Almighty God in this pursuing Father, which is what ultimately brings us home. And so let me give you the sermon in a sentence. If you're taking notes, I would encourage you to write this down. We come home by trading works-based religion for a grace-based celebration. Verse 25. Now his older son was in the field. So stop right there. We already see who's most vulnerable. Who's the chief candidate for works-based religion. It's the person who's right where they're supposed to be. The person who's saying all the right things. Avoiding the bad places. The son, he's working hard in the father's fields. And maybe that's you. Maybe, maybe you feel like God actually owes you because you're where and doing what you're supposed to be doing. You've stayed sober. You've gone on the mission trips. You're single and you're keeping it classy. You work hard. You make an honest living. You've attended Mass. You've said your Hail Marys. You went to confirmation class as a child. You've been baptized. You, you, you do your time with the Lord each and every morning. And here's the thing. You wouldn't come right out and say it, but underneath the surface, there is this sense of entitlement that says, God, you owe me. Yikes. We must be careful. Next verse. 25, uh, continuing. And as he came and drew near to the house. Okay, he's out in the fields, drew near to the house. Don't miss this. You can be close to the Father's house, but far from the Father's heart. Most of the Pharisees who this parable is targeting worked in the temple where God's presence dwelled, but their hearts were far from Him. Isaiah 29, 13. This people draw near with their mouth while their hearts are far from me. Or Matthew 23, 27, which I doubt is on any of your Pinterest boards. You're like, Jeremy, how do you know about Pinterest boards? I'm not taking questions at this time. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones. Jesus. So for all the I grew up in church, or I've been a Christian all my life, or I'm reluctant to have any friends who are far from God. God's heart is for you. God loves you. God pursues you to the cross. But be alert and be cautioned because you're no less immune than those who are showing the smoke signals of outward rebellion. It doesn't matter if you can quote John 3.16. It doesn't matter if you avoid all the R-rated movies except for Passion of the Christ. It doesn't matter if you have covenant eyes on your phone. It doesn't matter if you sponsor a child in Ecuador through compassion. You can do all this and still be far from God and God not have your heart. So drawing near, he heard music and dancing. You'd think, okay, all right, party, pulling up, let's have a good time. But... I'm not just thinking about, like, how do you hear dancing? I understand hearing music. How do you hear dancing? That's because this is not just some little TikTok wiggle. People are singing. People are laughing. People are dancing. People are feasting. People are having a really good time, except the older brother. Verse 26. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. So works-based religion, here's the anatomy, is quick to question the joy of others. You've heard the saying, misery loves company. Case in point with religion. In general, religious people are unhappy. Maybe you uh, watched Sesame Street growing up. Maybe you still watch Sesame Street. Amen. Um, there's this character named Oscar the Grouch. Do you know him? He lives in a trash can. And he's miserable. And because he lives in a trash can, it's like he's trying to make everybody else's Life, miserable. So when you think about religion, think about Oscar the Grouch. Verse 27. And he said to him, Your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf 
Why? Because he has received him back safe and sound. So I want you to notice how the servant identifies the son. He views him as restored to the family. This is significant because when that son wandered off, that servant probably took a pay cut. And yet here he is, he's saying, your brother, he's still your brother. He's still your father's son. He's still one of my masters. He's home. We're celebrating. And then the the tension really begins to compound when you ask this question, how will the older brother respond and will he join the servant and the father in welcoming his brother home? Verse 28a, but he was angry and refused to go in. So you have, to, you have to understand the anger of this son. You have to understand how a Jewish inheritance was passed on. So the older brother would have been entitled to two-thirds of the father's fortune and estate. And so the younger brother would have been entitled to one-third of the estate after the father passed away, mind you. So let's just recognize that the father was a successful businessman. And let's just say, for practical purposes, his fortune was worth a million dollars before the younger brother left home. But then the younger brother took off a third. It's over $300,000 that he has taken in property and assets. And so the older son's left with the difference. At this point, the older son's probably really bitter, mad, but not to the point of anger that we see right here because he still gets all the, the difference that he was entitled to to begin with. He doesn't have another uh, brother to split it with. But by bringing the younger brother back into the family, the father's made him an heir again. This means that he gets another claim to another one-third of their now diminished wealth. And so practically, this is going to cost the older brother about $200,000 in his inheritance. So it's understandable how the older brother would be angry. Right? And as I'm looking at sin in the mirror this week under this text, I'm thinking about how I am a recovering, angry older brother. I myself am a recovering Pharisee. And so there's something inside of me that relates to this. There's something inside of me that sympathizes with this. But there's something inside of me, it's got to be the Holy Spirit that says this can't be the way of Jesus. Because the way that this anger is worded in Greek is it says it was more than righteous anger. This had been smoldering in the soul of the older brother for a long time. And like a volcano, he erupts. And we see he would prefer his brother to be dead. And loved ones, this is where anger becomes sinful. It's when we move from disappointment over an offense to a desire to hurt the offender. This is not the way of Jesus. The Bible has a lot to say about anger. Maybe you've heard about angry Jesus with a bull whip cleansing the temple in John chapter 2. You don't see that in a lot of children's storybook Bibles. Maybe we need to write that story and put it in there because it's there. But what, what was it that Jesus was actually angry about and why? Well, the reason why Jesus did this is because there were older brothers placed throughout the temple who were obstructing access to the gospel and keeping people from coming home. That's righteous anger. But you contrast that with the anger of the older brother, and he's mad because people are coming home to God. And here's here's the deal. You and I, we're going to get angry. There's a right way to do it, and there's a wrong way to do it. Ephesians 4.26 says, Be angry. All right, there you go. But do not sin. So this tells us it's possible to be angry in a way that actually honors God. But do not let the sun go down on your anger. It's like God is saying anger is inevitable, but injury is optional. And don't, don't let the sun go down on your anger. I've always like, thought about, like, what does that really mean? It's like God is saying, you got 12 hours to remember the gospel. you got 12 hours to remember what God did with his anger toward you. He cast it on Jesus. He covered you. He cleansed you. And for you to weaponize your anger in a direction other than the cross is to fundamentally forsake the gospel. How much do you believe this practically, relationally, functionally? If you see the anger of God which was righteous and right cast on Jesus, then you can't redirect it to another human being who's created in His image. 
Verse 28b. How does the father respond? He comes out. His father came out and entreated him. And so I want to show you the first of three ways that God brings us home from Act 2 in the story. First is this. God brings us home by graciously coming outside to us. By refusing to join the Feast of Salvation, the older brother dishonors his father every bit as much as the younger brother. Have you ever invited someone to a get-together or to an occasion and you just felt like their presence would make, make it better and it just would be really personal to you, but they didn't come? And you were hurt? It, multiply that hurt and, and we start to get it. You see, to expect the patriarch, the father, to leave the feast and to come out to the sulking son was both an interruption and an insult. And what does the father do? He does it with care, with concern, with compassion. The word entreat means to plead. And so if grace were absent in this conversation, it would sound very different. But I, I picture the father coming in close on his sulking older son, saying, son, what are you doing outside? It's cold. You're hungry. You're tired. Your wife and children are inside. Your younger brother is alive and home. We will rebuild. I get it. Please come inside and join the feast. This is a picture of what God in Christ has done for us. He left the feast of heaven when He didn't have to. Where He belonged to come out to we who were standing, arms crossed in darkness where He didn't belong. And how did He entreat us? Not harshly, but mercifully. Hebrews 13.12 reminds us that when Jesus was crucified, He was led outside the city to a place of shame. But more than a place of execution, this was a picture of just how far He would come to meet you, even you, yes you, in your fear and in your anger. And I'm curious to know, where is outside the feast for you? Is it a person who wronged you? Is it a promotion that you didn't get? Is it a problem that you didn't cause but you're suffering for? Is it a place that you just feel like, God, I don't belong here, but you place me here? Wherever or whatever that may be, Christ will meet you there. And when He does, He comes in close with the same care, compassion, and concern as this Father does with His Son who doesn't deserve it. Behold the Gospel. Verse 29. But He answered His Father, Look, these many years I have served you and I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. Notice how the son does not say, esteemed father, but simply look, which is equivalent to look you. So in a culture where respect and, and deference to elders was all important, such behavior, such conversational aggression was outrageous. And what we see is that the son tells on himself. From the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? And, and we see that the son has had his motive exposed. And all along, he's been just as far from the father as the son who wandered off. Because the father's never had his heart. It was always transactional. Notice how he says, I have served you and I've never disobeyed you. So that word for serve means slave. Religious people who are rooting their relationship with God and their own works, treat obedience to God like a begrudging chore. And we don't, we don't like it that God's house is a house of mercy. We want it to be a house of merit. But he says, not in the economy of my house. You see, works-based religion makes us believe the lie that we are more deserving than others, and the difference is so clear. You see, when the younger brother comes home, what does he say? Father, I am no longer worthy. Have mercy on me. And what does the older brother say? He says, I never disobeyed. So reward me. Verse 30. But when this son of yours came. All right. Son of yours. 
He's renounced the relationship. He has cut his brother off completely and totally. This son of yours came who has devoured your property with prostitutes. You killed the fattened calf for him. So works-based religion spotlights the sins that I don't struggle with. Now, there is reason to believe that the younger son did interact with prostitutes, but there's no mention in the story. The first time that's brought up is when the younger brother assumes the worst. And it's probably because that was a sin that he didn't struggle with. What is, what is gossip? What is slander? Oftentimes it's confessing the sins of other people that we ourselves don't struggle with. And so what's going on right here is the son, he's slandering. He's coming after the reputation of the son, diminishing his credibility, looking to cancel his place in the family. This is the dark side of being good. Because you're more likely to cross your arms at all the bad people who struggle with the things that you don't. And you don't get to pick your poison when it comes to brokenness. The fall affects us all, but it affects us all differently. And all sins are egregious. All, all sins are offensive in the sight of God, even when they're more subtle. We can easily imagine this son saying of the father, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So actor and comedian Jeff Foxworthy, in the early 90s, he came out with these one-liner jokes about you might be a redneck if, here we go, here, here was a few of those. You might be a redneck if the biggest sign outside your business says minnows. You might be a redneck if you list beginner's luck as a skill on a job application. You might be a redneck if your uncle's last words were, hey, watch this. You might be a redneck if the family business requires a lookout. You might be a redneck if you use your belt buckle as a form of identification. You might be stuck in workspace religion if I frequently criticize others. You remember American Idol? Simon Cowell, after the contestant would sing their song and it would get to Simon, they would shudder. Why? Because he was constantly criticizing. He would hold nothing back and but short of a perfect performance, he was going to give you the business. And this is what it's like being around a critical person. None of us feel safe. This is what it's like when, when we pour out criticism to other people as we put others on edge and make others tense, but works-based religion, what does it do? It overlooks the good and overstates the bad. But what does a grace-based celebration do? It overlooks the bad and celebrates the good. You might be stuck in works-based religion if I regularly complain about my life with all its challenges. One Harvard study from 2017 that lasted eight years with 70,000 participants showed that the glass half-empty crowd lived on average five fewer years and their brain function had significantly deteriorate, deteriorated more than the half glass full folks no one audits sin no one audits struggles no one audits suffering but here's what can help attack the root of our complaining it's understanding the ways of god he's not going to deliver you from suffering altogether that's not how he works that's not the life of jesus he's going to deliver you through suffering. As I pass through the waters, you are with me. As I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are my shepherd and I will fear not. I think there's two things that drive the chronic complaints. Number one, I've lost sight that this world is not my home. And so I'm so preoccupied with making it cozy, comfortable, and convenient that I forget that there's a better future and a better forever that awaits me in eternity that Jesus has purchased in my place. What's the solution for the Christ follower? Here it is. For the religious person, here it is. This is as bad as it will ever be. Be warned, outside of Christ, but for faith in His finished work, this is as good as it will ever be. Another thing that drives the complaints is I've lost sight of how good God has been to me. And so here's a plumb line for progress. Replace the complaints with thanks. Replace the complaints with thanks. For every reason you have to complain, you have five to give God credit for His goodness that you don't deserve. You might be stuck in workspace religion if I instinctively compare my quality of life with others. So you live in the land of Ur, and it's a terrible place. They're prettier. They're stronger. They're faster. 
They're smart Ur. And here's what happens in the land of Ur. You get angry. You get jealous. And, and you marshal that jealousy into resentment that literally wants to take the good from other people because you don't have it. And you think their life is better than yours. And first of all, you're wrong because you're just looking at a scene. You're not looking at their whole story. And you're, you're looking at their Instagram feed when you don't realize the deep darkness that they've walked through on the other side of those posts. They wake up with bedhead too, okay? You don't have to post that, but it is what it is. Andy Stanley said there's no win in comparison. Uh, I think about, I don't know if you've ever seen a bunch of crabs in a bucket before, but if one of the crabs will actually try to crawl out, the others will pinch it and pull it back down. Or if one crab gets a morsel or some type of food, the other crabs will pinch it and try to take it away. And this is what it's like with comparison. It's like, I want to take any good that another person could have because I feel like God's not been good enough to me. You might be stuck in works-based religion if I smugly condemn those who injure or aren't like me. Understand, condemnation is of the devil. And it's his end game for you. You need to understand, God has great sympathy for the condemners. Why? Because he knows that what you're doing is you're actually projecting how you feel in your interior life. And it's why he gives us precious promises like Romans 8, 1. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And the less that we feel condemned, the more that we swim in the ocean of the gospel of grace, the less we're going to forecast that condemnation in the lives of other people and project it outwardly. And all of this, what is it? It's smoke rising from the fires of works-based religion. It's present in the older brother, and it's present in many of us. And the point of the... This is why grace is the hallmark of the Christian life. It's because the point of the parable is not the bad behavior of the sons. It's the gracious father's response. And the irony here, it's how the, the older brother has the same attitude toward the father as the younger son. He was just better at hiding it. Verse 31, and he said to him, the father, son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. God brings us home by graciously reoffering his presence. Notice how the father responds to his boy. He doesn't say traitor. He says son. Son, he's still offering him his presence. He's still offering him relationship. Even when the older brother's actions show that he has ended the relationship with the father entirely. But what does the father do? He tenderly refers to him as son. And this means that just like he couldn't stop loving His younger, rebellious boy. He couldn't stop loving his older, religious boy. And here he's re-offering his presence. He says, son, you're always with me. And all that is mine is yours. And this is the Father's way of graciously saying, son, none of the gifts your hard heart desires will last without me in your life. And in the story of these two sons, it's the story of all of us. The greatest Present is God's presence. He's trying to teach the older son what his younger son recently discovered the hard way. That no gift is greater than the giver. Maybe you've heard it said, the gift that keeps on giving. I think there's some truth in that. But the full truth is, the giver keeps on giving. Our daughter Eleanor is in an age and stage where all she wants to do is snack. She's always wanting a snack. She will literally come and say, Mommy, Daddy, is it snack 30? It's a time in our house. And uh, mom goals over here, my wife Victoria, she just like whips snacks out of thin air. It's like this like ninja move. I don't even know where the snacks come from. And they're like healthy and good for her. And I'm like, well, how, how'd that get there? It, it, I'm thinking about if Eleanor came to us and said, Mommy and Daddy, I want your snacks, but I don't want you. Well, first of all, we would sit down with the little deer and we would appeal to her heart. <laughs> and we would say, hey, sweetie, you don't, you don't want that. No, 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 you don't understand. And second of all, those runs to Target and Aldi would abruptly end if you were to want the gifts without the giver. Understand that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. 
And just like the father reoffers his presence to the younger brother and the older brother, Jesus reoffers his presence to you and to me on the cross. Verse 32. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. And so the parable ends with a surprising reversal of fortune. Do you see it? The younger brother has come home and is inside the house celebrating. The older brother who stayed home has now left home and is outside the house, outside of fellowship with the father, sulking. Shockingly, the older brother is now farther from the father. This parable could rightly be called lost in the father's house. And here's the cliffhanger question. Will the older brother come home? We don't know. And that's the genius of how Jesus told the story. It's because he knew that those who are listening then and those who are listening now are a lot like this older brother. And it's as if he's saying, you decide. You make the decision on whether or not you're going to come back inside and feast with the father. It's as if he's saying, you're no less welcome in my house than the younger brother, but I will no more force you to come home than I did the younger brother. Tim Keller By putting a flawed older brother in the story, Jesus is inviting us to imagine and yearn for a true one. And this is the last way that God brings us home from this story. God brings us home as our true and better older brother. You see, grace is God giving us something really good when we deserve something really bad. But grace is not opposed to justice. When we offend God, when we sin against Him, the consequence must be cast on someone. It must be covered by another if we are not to be punished. And this is why we see that the true older brother is Jesus. You think about it, the younger brother, his restoration, it came at enormous cost to the older brother. And the only way the father could reinstate him was at the expense of the older brother. And we read in Romans 8.29, where where Paul pins in the greatest chapter in all of Scripture, That Jesus is the firstborn among many brothers. And see the difference. Whereas the older brother in this story and Jesus in your story, he not only paid the cost, but he was glad to do it. And unlike the crossed arms of of the older brother toward his younger brother in this story, you see the open arms of Jesus running to you at the cross. And it was there that He was stripped of His robe. He was stripped of His dignity so that you could be covered and restored with with honor and with with wealth of, of spirit for all eternity. We see that He left His heavenly inheritance, came down in the form of flesh, and he, he, he left his inheritance so that you and I could share in that inheritance. He came outside when he could have stayed inside because he wanted us to be back inside with him. And here's the question that I, w- I just want to end this series with. Won't you come home to a God like this? Why, why would you go anywhere else? Why would, you, why would you look for love in any lesser sources? Why would you look for comfort? Why would you look for home in the arms of anyone less than Christ? So if you would bow your heads and open your hearts. I just want to pray for you. We're going to have our care team in the back. If you need prayer, you can can move to the back at any moment. And they would love to pray for you. But Father, I'm, I'm thinking about who was in the room when you told these three stories about a lost sheep, a lost coin, and two lost sons. And if there's something that's so obvious, it's that We are needy. We need You, God. And Lord, would You peel away the scales of our our pride. And we, just as a church, we acknowledge our need for You. And, And we rest our trust and faith in Your finished work. God, we gaze in wonder at You as our true and better older brother who didn't just pay the cost, but was glad to do it. Lord, we are glad in grace and would you pour it out on your people in jesus name we pray amen